Like many of people in the audience, I've been reading about this technique, this technology for a long time. And you did something very bold. Um, you actually went and did it. And so before we get into the history and all, why don't you just explain what this technology is? I mean, the, the notion of this mitochondrial disease and using this, what people call controversial, I don't think it is, but what people call this controversial technology. Why don't you just explain what it is? Okay. See if I can explain in two minutes. So any cell, as we all know, or the eggs, let's take the chicken egg. We have egg yolk and egg white. So egg yolk, which we call the nuclear, carry all the DNA material to determine who we are. And egg white, which on the egg shell, is in control of how the DNA is going to be replicated, whether it can cause a healthy baby or any genetic disease. So mitochondrial DNA disease is a, a very complicated disease, which is the cause of the mitochondrial DNA in the egg white has problem. So our technique is take the egg yolk from the patient and swamp with a donor egg and take a donor egg white, uh, egg yolk out and put the patient egg yolk inside. So now you have a reconstituted egg right. with a patient egg yolk and with a donor egg, egg white. Then get this egg fertilized, making healthy live births. So this is called three parents baby. So you have two, basically you have two mommy and one daddy. So this is the technique. So the chromosomes from the mother, the chromosomes from the father, and the mitochondrial DNA from, from the donor third egg. party. Mm -hmm. So obviously women and you know it, it, with mitochondrial defects, it's very hard for them to have children. And if they do, many times they don't live past six months, a year, two years. And so there was a family that came to you. Um, and why don't you tell the story of the family and how you ended up in Mexico to do this procedure? Yeah, so mitochondrial DNA disease is uh, not for the normal um, uh, mammalian inheritance. So you can have a very healthy baby born for five seconds then getting very sick. So this uh, couple had uh, six pregnancies and three miscarriages and uh, two diseased baby at uh, six months and uh, eight years. Now, mitochondrial DNA disease can be very- so the, the, the children died at six months old and, and eight, eight, months, year, eight, eight, year old. eight years old. And uh, David, just to point about uh, the mitochondrial DNA disease, which causes muscular and neural cell dystrophy. So usually these kids will be wheelchair bound and they, can, they have to be on the life support for a long time. So it's really very detrimental to the family, to the parents, and of course, to the kids. So getting to Mexico, obviously, you could have done this procedure anywhere in the world, um, except the United States. Now, it's, it's become legal, or it's being allowed in the United Kingdom. In the United States, it's certainly not clear. And so you brought the mother to do this procedure to Mexico City. This was about five years discussion about the technology, the risks, and the benefits. and. Uh, after spending 20 years of research on this technology, and we did a multiple generation studies in the animal models. Right. So we carry on this study. And we just have a clinic in Mexico, so we did a transfer process in Mexico, but the whole research development was in the United States. And so, you know, the interesting part, mm -hmm. or the complex part about something like this, is we're never gonna know the true results until five, 10, 20 years out there. Okay. Do you, have you consented to follow up on the child so we know what happens over the next several decades? Very good question. As of today, we know the first IVF baby was born in 1978. More than millions, millions of live birth baby has been obtained from in vitro fertilization. But as of today, it's still considered to be experimental. As of today, just to deviate from your question a little bit, there is zero, a single penny research money was from government. So the whole industry of in vitro fertilization and research are all private funded. So that's actually, I want to debate one more from that conversation. I was very touched yesterday, Gates Foundation, you know, come to ask our colleague, can you deliver medicine to prevent the AIDS? But I hope one day Gates Foundation will come to me and say, can you try to get all the babies, produce healthy babies, and there is a 90% of infertility couple, they cannot get a treatment. 
because the government does not give any single penny and all the insurance from private. So again, I want to debate a little bit more. Well, let's get back yeah. to okay. the issue. I, okay. I understand the yeah. funding issue, mm. but let's get back to here. Mm. So you know, going to Mexico was obviously done because there was lower risk there, right? What happens if you did this procedure in New York? What would happen if you had done it in New York City? We have a really um, think about it that way. It's just uh, strategically this project was done in Mexico City. Now it's interesting things in, in United States. Actually, there is no government organization uh, oversee and guideline this kind of research. So I hope your question actually going to reach out to the government that we should have a proper organization just like the UK to discuss. I, I agree. That's what I was getting thing. at. Is that yeah. you know who's in charge? I mean, nobody in charge. When we have moral. Eth well, that's a whole different issue that we can get into. No, I will explain to you why but, 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 but so mm -hmm. moral, ethical, legal, I agree with you. We now have the technology, for example, through CRISPR, to with surgical precision change one of the three billion letters of the DNA code. So in addition to mitochondrial disorders, I can come to you and say, hey, I have sickle cell trait and so does my wife. Can you fix that in the embryo? You can obviously use this mitochondrial disorder potentially in a woman who's in her late 40s or 50s and potentially enable pregnancy in them. So the big challenge is, is that where do we draw the line? Who's in charge there? And how do we make certain that there's follow-up on the children so we know we did the right thing? Yes. So like any kind of medical research breakthrough, long-term follow-up to the kids or any kind of clinical treatment is mandatory. To answer your question, yes, absolutely, David. If you'd say, I have a sickle cell trait, can you treat me? I said, absolutely, no problem. By the way, you want to, I want to ask you, you want your future kids to go to Harvard or Yale? We can manipulate the gene a little bit. It's not a scientific fiction. It can be done. Right. Princeton, I went to, not Harvard a year. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. nothing personal. I just pick up some. <laughs> um, and, and so, you know, obviously it's a big issue now. Um, we have the Supreme Court who looks at things that violate the Constitution. They ruled two years ago that you can no longer patent a gene in our country. And that was a step forward, but it took 15 years of that case going through the process. You know, here now, we're having remarkable scientific advances, yet I'm not sure who's in charge and what agency is responsible for looking at the moral, ethical, legal guidelines. When gene therapy first came out, we set up separate commissions to do this, and it set up guidelines. But obviously, something new has to happen here. So take us through the steps. You know, the family mm -hmm. came to you. You know, you had decided that, you know, they agreed to do this procedure, and they realized that they didn't want to go through the horror of another child being born with a mitochondrial disorder. Correct. And so, why Mexico? Yeah, so to answer the first question, I just want to comment. The reason we don't have a proper organization to oversee, guide, guide this field of research right. is all this research is considered as part of a human IVF, and the federal have a law that have federal research grant not allowed to do anything related to IVF. That's why they cannot even establish an uh, overseeing body to, to guide us, to tell us what How to many do. children have been born with IVF in total? I think with my rough idea, at least more than five million babies was born around so an the amazing world. concept. Five million children born with this technology. Still considered it's experimental. Yet we still can't use federal funds. Zero up to, to actually today. improve it and make it better. Yes. Um, That's why we need the Gates Foundations. <laughs> so let's get back to this. So, how are you going to follow the child? What's, I mean, do you, are they coming in every six months for aptitude tests, growth tests? What's the procedure to make sure and to look at the outcome with the child? Actually, it's the easy, quickest way to do is just to look at the physical activity. Because mitochondrial DNA disease, the first defect is in the muscular cells. So the kids, the minutes they cannot eat, they cannot breathe, you know there's issues. Right. So you really don't need any fancy DNA analysis. You don't really need any kind of brain MRI. Even the patient will tell me, he said, during the gestational stage, they already tell this baby different. I said, how can you tell? They said, this baby moving. But there's some argument that you know, maternal mitochondrial DNA and chromosomal DNA evolve together. Mm -hmm. And when you mix and match, maybe there's going to be effect on cognitive function later on. Maybe there will be effect on hormone levels in their 20s that will affect the risk for X cancer or Y. So, I mean, obviously, we need to study other things in addition to just the mitochondrial-related defects. Absolutely correct. That's why this, from the scientific point of view, this is a very valuable model to follow up in the long term. 
from the gene expression in pathogenetic, potential pathogenetic changes, and right. this is definitely a must to follow up. So who's going to follow the child for the next 20 years? I think is a, at the beginning will be the perinatologist, and then will be neonatologist, and the pediatrician, and then just like IVF baby. Still so need there's to a protocol up. set up, or you're establishing it now? We're establishing a protocol for the future development. Got it. Yeah. And then let's get back to the why Mexico. Why not Panama? Why not Beijing? Why not London? Why Mexico? Well, we are thinking London now because the UK government already gave the green lights for this research. But being the Mexico, it's just uh, we have uh, a long operation in Mexico for the last eight years. Why? Hmm? Why Mexico? Well, it's a nice weather. It's <laughs> close to San Diego. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Um, and the, uh, uh, you know, recently, you asked something else that was, you know, again, people looked at it as controversial and that you were looking to give away in vitro fertilizations mm -hmm. as part of a lottery on Facebook. Correct. So why do that? Why go through this very public process of people, almost a competition, to win IVF procedures? It yeah, came back to the very first question that 90% uh, of the couples who need IVF treatment uh, give up the treatment because they don't have a proper insurance. And the government insurance definitely, Obamacare definitely will not cover IVF. So. Last week is uh, uh, National Fertility Week. Now, by the way, we have an uh, AIDS week, AIDS walk, breast cancer walk. We have so many awareness around the whole country, but very, 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 very few activity about awareness of fertility, not to mention our countries in fertility crisis. So when I heard there are such good things happen, I said, what do we can do? When I look at open all the newspapers, there's no any activity apart from newspapers that this is a fertility week. I said, even in the restaurant week in New York City, right. every restaurant gives a 20% discount. And I said, can we just do something? And hopefully to initiate more colleagues to participate in this activity. So that's why we came out with this uh, 30 case lottery. And I think it's going to be draw May 4th on the Facebook. So <laughs> stay in tune. So. Do your colleagues in IVF view you as a maverick? Are you viewed as you know, a hero to them? Are you viewed as, why is he doing this? How do your colleagues look at you? You know, as a physician, 80% of the time every day, I face the patient come here, they want to have a baby. So for me, my passion and my really concern, what are we going to do for the patient? What are the patient going to think about? I like that. What answer. do my colleagues think about? It's important, but it's really not vital. Right. So what do we can do the best for our patient? And that's what I will tell my staff too, you know. Always think about you as a patient because the psychological impact of infertility is just next to the cancer and the AIDS. And 30% of the family end up with a broken family if they do not accomplish a pregnancy in three years. They all went with the divorce and everything. I saw every single day. I saw the couple came, they dating for 10 years, and they on the contraception for eight years, they said, we are ready, David. We don't want a baby. They tried for two years, not pregnant. I said, you are 45. Even five years ago, your chance to get pregnant is only 5%. Nobody ever told me. And if I have knew that, I would have done something five years ago. And this is not a very uncommon story. It's, if you ask the whole general population, I don't think 80% of the ladies knows if they reach to 42 years old, their overall chance of live birth baby is 5% or less. We need more awareness. So John, as we get to the end of, uh, of our conversation here, what's the limit? I mean, will a 60-year-old woman be able to go through a technology like this, do you think? And oh, David, you just came out with all the good questions. I hope we would have a whole day to talk about it. But to just to come, I'm trying to finish in 20 seconds. So with the technology, we developed this three parents baby. Right. And another application called the rejuvenation of all sites. So if our research is going in the right direction, and in the next five, 10 years, any lady at age 42 to 47 should have a baby with their own eggs, which at this moment, up to age 43, almost a chance of baby with your own eggs is zero. So I think it's great help. But when we talk about preventative medicine, I think our major effort in the next 10 years is not trying to just see how to get a lady pregnant at age 42 to 47. We really think all the ladies at age 
25 to 35 right. should free their ex. If they do not think they can have a family in the next five to 10 years, that will be really preventative medicine. Well, thank you for having this discussion, thank you, and thank you for the discourse that hopefully will bring up the legal, the ethical, moral discussion around the country because it needs to happen now. I appreciate it. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.